Every year, millions of students graduate from higher education and enter the job market. They've dedicated years to studying their subjects of choice, but often find they're ill prepared to enter the workforce. Over the course of this discussion, we will talk about where the gaps in the graduate skills market lie and how universities can help students meet the growing demand. Charles and Leslie have both prepared presentations for us today, so I will hand over to the two of you to tell us a little bit more. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Charles Hardy from LinkedIn here. Uh, it's great to be here to talk a little bit about uh, what LinkedIn's doing in connecting the dots from education through to employment. Of course, LinkedIn has always been about connecting people and connecting opportunities. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be joined uh, by Leslie Taylor from BCU. Uh, so we've both got a little presentation to set the scene uh, before we open up for a bit of Q&A uh, a little later on. As you can imagine, LinkedIn has access to a phenomenal repository of data and insights on the global workforce through LinkedIn.com. We collaborate with the World Economic Forum and other public policy organizations to share insights on real-time changes in the global economy. Prior to COVID, digital transformation and the increase in automation and AI had started to significantly impact our workplaces. The pandemic increased that velocity almost overnight, and we all felt the pinch as the institutions and businesses were forced to pivot very, very quickly. As a result, the degree of AI and automation has accelerated, which has increased skill shortages across Europe. And it's estimated that 40% of all current employees will need to upskill or reskill uh, in the next few years. However, even while technologies replace some jobs, they are creating new work in industries that most of us might not even imagine and new ways to generate income. The World Economic Forum estimates that 97 million roles will be created as a result of the digital transformation of our businesses in the next few years. This creates both an opportunity and a challenge for higher education institutions to anticipate those emerging skills and prepare your students for a rapidly changing world of work. This is where LinkedIn can actually really help you. With over 750 million members, 50 million companies, and 15 million plus jobs on LinkedIn, we have a wealth of big data, if I dare say it. So we call this the LinkedIn economic graph. And the live and shifting nature of the, this community of, of people and organizations enables us to identify and monitor trends in jobs and skills across industries and geographies. It's truly a unique window on the world of work. So we can use this data to connect those dots from education to employment. For example, in collaboration with LinkedIn, the World Economic Forum was able to highlight the 10 most in-demand skills estimated for 2025. As you can see, a significant proportion of these would could be considered foundational or transferable skills. Communication, analytical thinking, creativity, these are all required across a vast spectrum of industries and occupations. They're also highly difficult to automate or replace with AI at least for now. So in order to future-proof your students, these are the foundational skills that every student should be developing in preparation for graduation and entering the world of work. We're always looking for ways to share LinkedIn insights on job boards, uh, sorry, on jobs and skills trends to help our members develop careers and to help organizations support staff and student skills development. Just want to showcase one of these tools here. This is a, a labor market widget that is uh, on our economic graph site. And you can see that you can configure uh, some criteria and filter some of our data. Uh, this is available to everyone uh, and uh, through this link. And this helps to track the top, uh, top trending employers, uh, the top trending jobs, uh, and also uh, the different skills that are highlighted as the top skills in that area. So you can cut it by, by country and by industry. We can also run custom reports uh, for our university and college clients. So here is an example of one of those. This is highlighting the most in-demand skills and the fastest growing skills 
uh, in a particular industry, in this case, software and IT services. So the left-hand table uh, in blue uh, is showing the most in-demand skills in the past 12 months uh, picked up through LinkedIn. And that's perfect, of course, for graduates going into the workplace imminently, say 2021. The right-hand table is actually very interesting because that's looking at the upcoming future. What are those skills that are accelerating and, and coming up on the rise? And making sure your students are getting tooled up in those if you're looking further ahead into 2022, 2023. Here's another example. Um, I've picked the design industry here. Uh, I've chosen some of these because they correlate to popular career destinations uh, for Birmingham City University, because we can also track where graduates and alumni take their careers further down the line. Here you can see Adobe, very big right now, of course, but notice how design theory and 3D CAD are on the rise on the right-hand side. This third example looks at media and communications. Design theory top again, um, but what's interesting on the right-hand side is that you can see it's not just leveraging new tech like TikTok, uh, in this case in marketing and comms, it's also looking at those key market trends like race relations and social inclusion that are the most important aspects of, for people going into these types of career. I'm actually very excited to announce uh, here today that we're gonna be launching a new interface called LinkedIn Talent Insights uh, that will enable universities and colleges to really tap in themselves to our data set and start to explore different trends uh, in these skills and in these jobs. You'll be able to access the data intelligence and, and that can help with curriculum planning. It can help with employability planning uh, and really having your finger on the pulse of what's happening in the, in the world of work and how best to equip your students uh, for their future careers. Here's just a, a quick snapshot uh, from within that tool that I took. And you can see I filtered on the left-hand side, just pick the UK and sales and business development. Uh, and that gives me a lot of data around what's happening in, in industries related to those criteria. Uh, the top employers, the top uh, the jobs, the level of demand, the top skills uh, related to this kind of role. We can even benchmark which universities are providing people into these particular jobs. So we're previewing this right now. It's gonna become available to everyone in July. So uh, I look forward to sharing that with you in the future. We use all of this data on LinkedIn to actually improve and develop our LinkedIn learning library of courses. Those insights help us understand where the new skills are trending and where we need to have a new course to help people connect into those career pathways, whether they're just starting out or whether they're a long way down their pathway, a bit like me. So, we pride ourselves that, that we have the most relevant and up-to-date skills training available. And that content is based on us working with experts in industry to develop these courses, uh, hand-picked experts who we'll work with to ensure that those courses are up-to-date uh, and relevant and trustworthy. And we're now working with, I think, over 60 UK universities to support both, both student skills development uh, within blended learning, uh, within uh, employability agendas, within digital skills and staff development uh, as well on a number of fronts. Now, one of those is Birmingham City University. And so that sounds like the perfect time for me to hand over to Leslie, my partner today. Thank you, Charles. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. As Charles indicated, I'm Leslie Taylor. I am Graduate Plus Programme Lead for Birmingham City University. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here today to sort of talk through the Graduate Plus Programme and how it sits with LinkedIn and a range of other resources and opportunities. So I think Charles is going to be managing my slides. So next slide, please, Charles. OK, so Graduate Plus, what is it? It basically is um, a virtual bespoke digital award program. It's a platform. It's a platform that we can sort of use in lots of different ways. And the beauty of sort of talking about it today is, but I can also share how we've pivoted in terms of, you know, crisis with the pandemic and where we are and what we've been doing. It's flexible. It's student driven. 
and that's very much part of the values and ethos of the award. It promotes opportunities. It actually gives the student an, a sense of direction and focus for them as an individual rather than a dictation of what we assume would be right or wrong for them. It sets expectations from the get-go. We want them to get involved. We don't want them to get involved in level six. We want them to get involved as soon as they hit university. It is that sense of you are part of this community and we want you as part of this community. And I suppose the other thing to sort of shout about, it's the first um, award program that has sort of been endorsed by Advance HE. So it's obviously gone through a fairly rigorous process in terms of where it was, where it is now and where it's going in the future. Next slide, please, Charles. OK, where did it come from? This is an interesting one. Um, normally awards up and down the land in universities tend to sit within careers teams and as a careers practitioner, I know that well. This one sat within the Education Development Service, previously Centre for Excellence, Learning and Teaching. So it was an interesting sort of philosophy that was sort of born. Five years ago, we were charged with, let's look at an award process. Let's see what we can do. Actually, with sitting within the, the academic realm, we, we actually looked at it slightly different because we obviously looked at sort of the strategic objectives around how this could be influenced in lots of different ways. And this is more of a holistic model. So Lizio really influenced the way we got a whole sort of university steering approach on this one in terms of a community, bringing lots of different elements together. But of course, then it was that tricky scenario. How do we then get this all sort of fitting together? Um, it fits a lot with sort of I am BCU, which is our culture and values of the university, and I can showcase that as we go through. Next slide, please, Charles. So when we look at this, we sort of think about the benefits. I'm going to obviously talk about the award in more detail in a little while, but as I said, it's holistic. It's well known across the university. It's well known across within our community, internal and external. And we also have something called Grad Plus Week twice a year, which is part of the academic calendar, which pulls it back in. Um, the other thing to note that the, we are based within the centre of the university, so we have a pivotal role within sort of that hub of the university. And again, when we pivoted out to a digital, that sort of helped us because we'd already got a really good traction rate. Um, we tend to get involved in all sorts of things. Um, we we don't often say no to many things and again actually that's part of the process of what grad plus is about we lead by example as a team as an award we sort of get involved in lots of different things and fundamentally we employ our own graduates so again if we're talking about sort of you know we we actually do believe in our graduates and they have been very much part of how this award has developed and i can sort of showcase that as we move on okay next slide please charles this is an interesting one um, and I just put this in as a bit of a provocative slide at this moment in time and it might provoke a little bit of conversation at the end. Um, the award started out many moons ago, five years to be precise, um, as a twinkle in our eye as an extracurricular program um, and we've gone from extracurricular to co-curricular to embed or not to embed. So it's an interesting one and I, as I say I'll come back to that so hold on to that thought as we move forward. Okay, next slide, please, Charles. Okay, so you're probably wondering, how does this award work? It's bespoke. We've got our own developer who has actually, you know, put up with us well over five years because as we tweak, we have our own graduates. As I say, they know exactly what it's like to try and get a job, whether it's in a pandemic or not. So they actually give us a lot of input and insight, which allows for regular development. But in essence, this is what the award looks like. The beauty of this is when we started out, we, we sort of like bronze, silver, gold, um, and we took sort of references from D of E, that sense of we're going on a journey and we're taking you through. Um, and, and you can see from sort of, we've also brought to, to life the BCU attributes, which sometimes gets sort of uh, sat in a lofty drawer somewhere. Actually, we brought these to light as part of that award process and going through the whole of the award. So the bronze is very much the attention, it's the attend, the involved, we want you to play, we want you to take your blinkers off. Then we've also got the silver and the gold, which brings in the competencies. And those lovely animations are a little key that says, this is how we've started to embed it. 
because actually at this moment in time we've got sort of a hybrid model students can use it as they feel they want to whether it's um extracurricular whether it's co-curricular but also we're now make, making sure that we're moving to an, a fully embedded model and that is how we do it we can actually use the award in its current state and we mandate 12 activities at bronze four activities at silver and four activities at gold and the trick is to identify different modules that fit the beauty of it is also that we can actually bring in and mandate certain activity, uh, activities and criteria that are appropriate for different levels and i'll talk about that furthermore the beauty of also doing the silver and gold we actually look at competencies so we've got 24 competencies in a bank that link to the institute student employers but we know that students graduates are going to be asked these competency based questions and we actually use the star technique so it's a very practical award it's not theory based it's practical can you reflect can you articulate these competencies that you are living and breathing within this university next slide please Giles. okay we do it in lots of different ways so that the award platform as you saw it previously we have loads of resources and some of those resources are unique to grad plus some of them are all over the university so we pull in we're almost a conduit for all the resources and bringing them together so it brings to life all of those sort of scenarios that we bring as part of a whole it also makes students aware that there's a shed load of opportunities we love LinkedIn and we mandate mm -hmm. LinkedIn as a registration activity at bronze when we talk about embedding. We also have the LinkedIn learning opportunities where we've got curated pieces. So there's a piece of work that's currently going on and actually has gone out to our final year students as we speak about saying this is e-learning and this is what you now need to sort of get considering about your next stage of life, but also reassuring them. Um, we have LinkedIn learning champions who are also sharing the love of not only LinkedIn, but Grad Plus and all those other resources about getting, maybe getting graduates and students ready for that world of work. We have a newsletter that we link to as well. So it's a wholly hosted sort of site that we can do lots of different things. Next slide, please, Giles. Okay. Uh, as part of the whole, we have Grad Plus Week. You can see a theme kicking in here we talk about embedded big time so we have we offer grad plus week where we have 90 different opportunities um twice a year and this is part of the academic calendar so everybody knows it's there and it includes everybody it includes internal external it includes students tedx we do all sorts of different things so grad plus week helps uptake of the award and that that is crucial in terms of how we work with the the particular award. Next slide, please, Charles. Students love it. Um, and I would say that, wouldn't I? But here is some evidence to support it. Um, they use it on all social media platforms, Twitter, LinkedIn, and they actually tell it as it is. They're proud of what they've achieved, whether it's bronze, silver and gold. We do have blinky pens, we do have certificates, and we do have badges, and they love those too. So is the, there is a sense of achievement and sort of fun but also there's a serious side to it next slide please charles and this is sort of a sample of feedback that we have from stakeholders um and obviously we've got sort of vance h he that the book rigorously looked at sort of the innards of this award which gives you a flavor of sort of we do take on board feedback and we consistently develop um, and again, we sort of look at how we are consistently moving forward. Next slide, please, Charles. This gives you an idea that traction is good. You know, if we're talking about sort of where we've got an engagement from, a, from the uh, very early start, it's massive, it's great. It's a three year program and we do an enrollment of sort of, so you are actually seeing historical from five years to now, and you're also seeing the enrolled sort of statistics. We're doing okay on the access and participation plan. But this is where the question regards embedding or not to embed really kicks in. Actually, we want every student to have a Grad Plus award, not just those who actually can do it and want to do it, and those who stumble across it because we provoke and promote it. But it's that, that sense of where we are going. And that's about hearts and minds. It's about periodic reviews. It's about the inclusive curriculum. So we are 
consistently moving forward in terms of what we are wanting to achieve. And we won't be happy until every BCU student has got a graduate plus, bronze, silver, gold, and hey, guess what? We've also got platinum for those that are true to their gold. So that's me. I hope that has been useful and I'm more than happy to sort of answer any questions at the end of this, this slide. So thank you very much. Thank you both for those presentations. Um, that gives us a really good foundation to build on and to answer some of the questions that we've had from our audience today. Uh, so I would like first to put to you, um, I think Charles probably will go to you first on this as it's quite LinkedIn uh, specific. What are the key learnings that LinkedIn can share from its own learning solutions that higher education institutions can benefit from? Yeah, thank you, uh, Ashton. I uh, quickly thinking of some of the key elements there. I, I think it's consistent reinforcement that it, rolling out education and particularly online with different resources, uh, not just LinkedIn Learning, but the, you know, the extensive resources Leslie mentioned there is, it's not a one-stop shop and it's how um, you're weaving them in to the everyday. How do they support? They're not a means, of their own, going to LinkedIn Learning is not a means of its own, but it is, it has a purpose in serving particular skills development or a particular line of education or personal de development, professional development. So it, it's, it's not a vertical itself, it's how it fits into everything else. Uh, and that, that embedding, that integration, uh, and that's the same within companies doing their own professional development of their staff. You know, it's how you weave it in that's the most fundamental thing. Thanks. And Leslie, as a member of a higher education institution yourself, what have you learned from uh, LinkedIn's insights? Yeah, I think it's an interesting sort of question. And, and actually, it dovetails to what has just been um, said by Charles. The fact that we are looking at life-wide and lifelong learning, that I think that's our, our biggest mantra that we have a responsibility to, to pass on to students and graduates. And I think it, it provides us with an opportunity to sort of encourage students and graduates to take blinkers off and it emulates real life because we're talking about long term personal and professional development. And the beauty of all of this is obviously what LinkedIn learning gives us is that opportunity to dip into a variety of different e learning packages, but also dovetail into and complement what we've got. Um, both for students and staff, actually, um, which has been quite useful in lots of different ways. And when we look at how we're embedding within the curriculum, we're all looking for resources that are that are emulating real life. And I think that's the beauty of it, because we are preparing people to fly the nest and be wonderful in life. So there's a whole host of different scenarios that we can tap into. And there's no one size fits all. That's probably... The, the biggest benefit is trying to make sure that we get that message across and that the students and graduates are thriving their own future with all the opportunities, whether that's within university, external to the university. I think we're all in it together is my take out from all of this, to be honest. Thank you. Um, you mentioned lifelong learning, which is an increasingly important aspect of education. We've had an unusual question here um, that sort of flips that idea on its head. Um, someone's asked, I noticed that children as young as 13 can join LinkedIn now. Will LinkedIn start bringing in resources for younger children and teens in relation to employability skills and courses? Is there any value in doing that? Uh, such a good question. Um, and, and actually it's it's now 16 for, for, for children, just to double back on that one. It was younger for a while, but it did shift. Um, it's not a LinkedIn plan to start engaging as young as that uh, through schools. Uh, I do some work with schools, uh, sort of uh, six form years, 12 and 13, in terms of considering employability skills and, and, and how they go out into the marketplace uh, with organizations like Career, the, the Careers and the Enterprise Company. Um, and there's probably more of our mothership, Microsoft, who are doing much more on the, on the digital skills and key skills. Um, and how we support that is probably more of the future 
uh, in terms of their engagement within schools, which is obviously much more significant. So for LinkedIn per se, it's more uh, advanced 16 plus uh, further higher education kind of level uh, rather than uh, any earlier. Thank you. Another question here, what skills areas are the most popular for adult learners either as part of upskilling or reskilling? Shall I go first? Uh, I just, oh, yeah. I, I think whenever I look at any trends on, on most popular courses, uh, it's, it's often rare to see Excel knocked off the top spot. Um, it's a, and, and, and that's pervading across everything. So those digital skills, of course, have been so popular and, and Teams and Zoom and everything in the last 12 months have been obviously trending. Um, but then we move into those sort of soft or professional skills, those transferable skills pieces, communication uh, skills, uh, working with other people, presenting, a lot of those core skills that, as I mentioned earlier, are relevant across so many different careers. That's the most popular learning are the ones that pervade everywhere. Uh, so, you know, no particular surprises there um, when you're looking at across the board. Uh, and then, of course, there'll be the niche skills for different, uh, different job roles or different industries. Thank you. Leslie, did you want to speak on that yeah, as well? Yeah, just to Please. sort of add to that. And, and again, it's an interesting one. You know, when we look at the notion of employability, we have sets of skills and we all look at competences in different ways. And we have to sort of also consider what are we, what, what's our role here in preparing students and graduates and people for life? And I think that the pandemic has probably honed us all in on that more than ever. Um, and, and, and when I think about the 24 back bank of competences, for instance, we have within Grad Plus, we've got the competences that graduate recruiters are saying that they need. And actually, resilience, that's one of the top trees that coming up at the moment that we are now starting to say, hey, this is really important. And you can demonstrate this by how and why. Um, so I concur with that. If there are certain skills that are specific to project management and things like that. But there are those soft skills that are really vitally important because how we communicate is massively important and that we must never detract from that as sort of a benchmark to sort of get students and graduates ready for wherever they are gonna go. And it's their life, I would say. Ashton, I'll just jump in there as well to say uh, on a, a quick plug for our LinkedIn Learning blog. If anyone wants to Google that, they'll find LinkedIn Learning blog and we regular post articles and features and research on trending skills in different industries, hard, hard skills, soft skills. So there's a, there's a wealth of insight there if anyone wants to tap into it. Thanks, Charles. Uh, we actually are coming up to the end of our time today. I think we could have spoken for a, certainly another few hours, but um, maybe, maybe everyone just wants to get off their Zoom calls at this point. Um, there will be a a great deal of post-event content available and if anyone does want to continue to engage with the work that LinkedIn is doing and um, you know how we can partner with universities then I'm sure THE will continue to put out a great deal of content on that side of things. Um, for now I would just like to thank Leslie and Charles for joining us today for your presentations um, and for all of the insights that you provided us with. Thank you.